Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. This is some turnout. This is some turnout. And I want to thank New York's finest. They just brought a lot of additions. So we have people, thousands of people outside that can't even get in, but they'll get in eventually. We appreciate it. New York's finest. Hello, New York City, and hello to all of the incredible, tough, strong, hardworking American patriots right here in the Bronx. Who would think? Who would think? I'm thrilled to be back in the city I grew up in, the city I spent my life in, the city I helped build, and the city that we all love, New York City. And I'm here tonight to declare that we are going to turn New York City around, and we are going to turn it around very, very quickly. We're going to bring safety back to our streets. We're going to bring success back to our schools. We're going to bring prosperity back to every neighborhood and every borough of the greatest city in our land. We're going to reduce taxes. We're going to bring businesses and big taxpayers back to New York. Got to bring them back. Got to bring them back. And we're going to make New York bigger, better, and more beautiful than ever before. And that includes right here in the Bronx. And it's going to be done and funded starting on January 20th, directly from our great and beautiful White House. Is that okay? For my whole life, I always thought that this city is a monumental testament to the power of the American spirit and the American dream. When New York started as a small, rugged Dutch trading post near the tip of Manhattan in 1624, what you see around you is nothing more than wilderness and marsh. But by the muscle and backbone and genius of the people of New York, we built the city into the towering forest of iron, aluminum, concrete, and steel. We made this city and state into the capital of global commerce. We turned our hometown into the bustling center of a confident, glamorous American culture, and we inspired the entire world. We inspired the world. No matter where you went on this planet, everyone knew that when you said, I'm a New Yorker, it meant you had smarts, you had grit, you had energy, and above all else, you had heart. You had heart, big, big, beautiful heart. Everybody wanted to be here. New York was where you came to make it big. You want to make it big, you had to be in New York. But sadly, this is now a city in decline. Throughout my life, I've seen New York through good times and bad, through boom times and crime waves, through market crashes and terrorist attacks. But I've never seen it quite like this. We have filthy encampments of drugged out homeless people living in our places that we've spent so much time with children where they used to play. We have lunatics killing innocent bystanders by pushing them onto the railroad tracks for sport. Our sob, uh, it's a sad, it's a sad thing. Don't worry, it gets positive. Don't worry. It gets so positive. Remember, we're going to win. We're all winners. We're going to win so big. We're going to make it bigger and better than ever before. Remember that. So don't worry. By the time the other six or 7,000 people get in, it'll be very positive. Our subways are squalid and unsafe. The ceiling tiles are falling down. And they look worse than a third world country. The medians of our highways are crumbling. Our sidewalks are littered with garbage, bottles, and trash. But worst of all, the discarded needles from people that so desperately are in need of help. And we have mobs of migrants fighting our police officers and giving America the middle finger. But we are not going to let this continue. We are not going to abandon our hope and our pride. This city has given us so much, and now it is time that we are going to give it back. 
Together we are going to make New York City great again and simultaneously we are going to make America great again. Thank you. I have come tonight to talk about solving problems. The simple fact is Joe Biden is not getting the job done for the Bronx. He's not getting the job done for New York. And he's not getting the job done for America. He is incompetent, ladies and gentlemen. He is grossly incompetent. I will get the job done as I did for four years, and I will get it done fast. And remember this, if a New Yorker can't save this country, no one can. No one can. Get me the, uh, get me the snake, please. The snake. Thank you, everybody. What a crowd. This is something. You know, we wanted to keep it small because who knew? This is like a love fest, love fest. It's a love fest. We love you. Thank you, darling. Thank you, wow. Who said we're not going to win New York? We're going to win New York so much. You know, if we win New York, we win the whole thing. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? We'll take back our country. And we'll do a job like nobody's ever done before. And what we did for four years was incredible, but we also learned a lot. We're going to get in there very fast with the right people, great people, people that are tested and true. Years ago, there was an ice skating rink the Wallman rink in the middle of Central Park. You know that story? That had been under construction for more than 10 years. They couldn't get it open. It was a renovation. They couldn't get it done. Mayor Koch was at his wit's ends. They just couldn't get it finished. They couldn't get it built. They couldn't get it open. People wanted to skate before their children turned old. Almost $20 million was spent over a long period of time. It was an embarrassment to the city. Every day they'd be laying the copper pipe and every night that same pipe would be stolen and then they'd start all over again the next day and it would be stolen. This went on weeks and weeks and months and months. They poured the concrete in small patches in wrong directions and at different heights and they took their advice from a refrigerator company from Miami where it's 95 degrees out. It was a total mess. They just didn't know what they were doing. And I saw this and I wanted my children to be able to ice skate before they didn't care about ice skating. I looked down on the rink and I said, what is going on? Years and years. So I volunteered and I took over the project and uh, did a good job. And when I took it over, I said that if it costs more than $2 million, I would pay for it the entire amount, but it cost far less. The first thing I did was call the Montreal Canadiens hockey team in Canada, right? Isn't that better than a refrigerator company from Miami? They didn't know what we were talking about, but the Montreal Canadiens knew and they were really nice. I'll never forget how nice they were. And they told me that you don't want to use copper tubing and gas because the gas is very delicate and it leaks. It's very fragile. It just doesn't work. You want to use rubber hose. I said, I like that. That's a lot cheaper. Water and salt. The salt makes it so the water doesn't freeze. It's called brine. And you're going to put that under the concrete. You're going to pour the concrete over the top. It's going to be great. It's going to work. Not going to leak. It's cheaper, faster, and it works all the time. And when we opened, there were no leaks. There were no problems whatsoever. Anyway, I started the project laid the rubber hose, mixed the water and the salt, 
beautifully together. I was down there when they were doing it. I said, you got to do it right. And covered the entire rink with concrete in four. Literally, you had to see this scene. Concrete trucks operated by the Teamsters. Do we have any Teamsters here? Oh. Oh, you got to make sure that O'Brien, he's a good man. He endorses Trump. I think he's going to, actually. But the Teamsters, it stretched all the way. You had trucks stretching all the way from the Wallman rink, which was, let's say, at 60th Street, all the way back to Harlem. One contiguous pour. It was a day and a half of pouring concrete. One contiguous, a giant surface, as you know. The rink was completed in just three months for far less than the $2 million projected. The biggest expense was actually the demolition. That is the demolishing of everything that was built so incorrectly, so badly over a 10 year period. The biggest cost was demolition, taking it, taking it all down and starting all over. We opened with a ceremony with all Olympic gold medal winners, including the great Peggy Fleming, Dorothy Hamill, Scott Hamilton, and all of the others. Every one of them was there. It was a beautiful night, beautiful weather. I'll never forget the evening. It was one of the most beautiful. My parents were there. Now they're looking down on us. They say, Wow, that's my son. Can you imagine? That's my son. Can you imagine? He's being tried in a court with a crooked judge. Can you believe this? Can you believe it? And highly conflicted judge at that. But everybody was there, and it was really something to behold. It was an incredible experience, and... One of the great experiences of my life in New York. We opened it. It's been successful and uh, successful ever since. What a great, great experience. It was beautiful. And, you know, a lot of it's common sense. You'd like to say the Republican Party is the party of common sense. You don't go to Miami when you want to make ice. You go to Canada when you want to make ice, right? Or you could go right down the road in the Bronx to Ferry Point, right? Everybody know about Ferry Point? It was another disaster, a development where the city had spent over 29 years, almost $300 million, trying to develop it into a luxury golf resort, resort, anything. They'll take anything. They were spending money. You know, trucks were going here, dumping, getting filled up, moving it here, dumping, getting filled up with the same stuff. This went on for years, back and forth, the same stuff. They were feather bedding. They were doing lots of bad things. But really, they didn't know how to get it done. They had no idea how much money they were spending. And when asked how much they spent, they said, we just don't know. that has been going on for years, decades. They were unable to do it. And at the time, the mayor, Michael Bloomberg, said, no, it's all right. It's OK. Now, Michael Bloomberg was the mayor, and he called me, he said, I have to get this done before I finish my term. It was very important to him. He was embarrassed by it. Everybody was embarrassed. Went through, it was the Mayor Koch. It went through a lot of different mayors. Almost 30 years, remember that. And he said, he, in all fairness, he said, I want to get this done. And you're the one that can do it. You're the only one that can do it. And I said, and I will do it. I will get it done. And we got it done before he finished his term, which was great. But there were no other bidders, to my knowledge, and I took over the project, spending only my money to build it. And I called all of the contractors together. These were tough people. These were tough, hard people. Many of you are probably contractors on that site. Come to that. And I said, look, fellas, you guys have made a fortune on this thing for years and years against the city. It's time we get together and build it. Let's get it built. Let's do it right. And let's get the hell out of here. We owe it to the city. And they worked so hard, the roughest, toughest contractors in New York. They had spirit like you've never seen before. And it was magnificently designed by the great Jack Nicholas, who told me, I don't want to make any more money. They paid me enough. They all got everybody get paid a fortune. Jack said, I don't want money. I just want to see it get built for the people of New York. And that's what we did. But everybody, just like Jack, they said very similar things. He's Guys were rough and tough, and they made a lot of money, but you'd think they'd want to make more, but they didn't. They just wanted to get it built. And in just a little more than a year, so this was going on for 30 years, including, think of it, just a magnificent thing to watch. You had to watch these people working, just the opposite of what took place for the first 29 years. But 
We had a magnificent world-class golf course that many of you have played now. And it's rated as one of the best public courses in the country. And then a short while later, we built a beautiful clubhouse, one of the prettiest I've seen. Built it, completed. The project was absolutely beautiful. It opened to great fanfare and great, great success. And do you want to hear the end result, though? Do you, should I? Should I go off teleprompter and tell you the end result? You think Biden goes off teleprompter? I don't think so. He's no good on teleprompter. No, but okay, so I did this beautiful job. And then we had a dispute over January 6th. We had a dispute. And they said, January 6th, we want to terminate his agreement with the city. I had a long-term agreement with the city. And they sent me a notice of termination. I said, wait a minute. I just spent $20, $25 million building it, built this magnificent clubhouse. It's in full operation. It took you 29 years. You were spending hundreds of millions of dollars. You couldn't get it done. And the neighborhood came to court it, totally for me. The Bronx neighbor. It's in the Bronx. It's on the East River in the Bronx. And we went to court. The city sued to break my agreement that they had just made. And I had done such a great job for them. And it was accolades everywhere. Golf Magazine, all of the big magazines were saying, what a great job. They terminated my agreement. And I went to court. And I will tell you, I had a very good experience. I, we had a Supreme Court justice named Deborah James. And I have to give her credit. I didn't know her, never met her. Deborah James, a African-American woman who came to my defense. We explained it and the city explained it. They said, we want to terminate it. They had no reason. And we said what we just said. And she looked at them and she said, in effect, how dare you? This man came in, he put up his own money, he did an incredible job, you were building it for 29 years. How dare you ask for this to be terminated? How unfair is that? Deborah James, a great Supreme Court justice, that's all I can tell you, and we won the case. But it's not easy doing business in New York, I'll tell you. Not easy, so I just appreciated that I had to tell that story. and. As you know, then I renovated Grand Central Terminal. I built the Grand Hyatt Hotel on 42nd Street and Park Avenue. And as part of that, I renovated the beautiful Grand Central Terminal, did a really good job of that. And then I was very much responsible for the construction of the Jacob Javits Convention Center, where Hillary Clinton was going to have her big evening. That was not good. Remember? We had the glass ceiling, you know, we built glass ceiling. She said, we're going to break the glass ceiling. It didn't work out. You know, I'll tell you a little secret that I don't think I've ever... I hated the concept. I said, we have to get on with our country. We have to win against Russia, we have to win against China, North Korea, all the different countries we're at loggerheads with. But as long as you have a smart president, you're going to win those battles. We're winning all those battles, even with the fake Russia, Russia, Russia scam, which made it harder. But you hated that. And then you see what they want to do to us, to me, to us. And they come along and they don't mind because Joe Biden is the worst president in the history of our country, has no sense doesn't know what he's doing, grossly incompetent, and our country is going to hell, but we're going to turn it around, we're going to turn it around fast. Because above all else, and I say this, and I believe this on New Yorkers, you are different, you do know that. You know that when I called for this rally, we said, let's just have a meeting, don't call it a rally. And so many people showed up, I said, like it or not, this is a rally. This is... <laughs> far as the eye can see. You have to see the lines outside, they're going for miles. But when we saw it and we saw the love, because I called up this morning, do the people like me or do they hate me? They said, they don't like you, sir, they love you. I said, oh, thank you. So I appreciate it. And I love you too. But above all else, <laughs>
Boy, look at all the cameras back there. That's amazing. That's the fake news. Yeah. You know, they'll say tonight, Donald Trump spoke to a very small crowd of people in the Bronx. It was a very hostile crowd, very hostile. They hated him very much. No, no, sometimes they're okay. You know, I agreed to do a debate with Crooked Joe Biden on CNN with Fake Tapper. And I think they'll be fair. Does anybody think they'll be fair? I might be. No. That's all right. When they said, here's your story, you can have a debate on CNN with Fake Tapper as the primary host. And I said, uh, I'll do it. Because you know what they thought is you'd say CNN and they'd say various people on the show, various anchors and, you know, headed up by Fake Tapper. And they thought I was going to reject it. I don't want to do it. Then Biden would say, I offered to debate, but he wouldn't do it. So they said, we want to have a debate. I'll take it. Well, we haven't even told you what the debate is all about. Then they said, Today, they said, we'd like to set up tables so you sit down. I said, I don't want to sit down for a debate. Let's go. At some point, so we're not sitting down. We're going to be standing up for the debate. And here's what you know. If Crooked Joe Biden makes it through the debate, which I think he will, they're going to say it was one of the great debate performances in history. One of the greatest debate performances. But there they are. And we're on every network tonight. I don't know what's going on. We're on Fox. We're on, we're on all of them. So have a lot of fun. But we're on all of them. So they understood. They understood before anyone how big this would be. And you got to see what's back there coming in. Thank you. Thank you. But above all, New Yorkers have something called common sense, and we do have common sense. An old-fashioned American common sense is exactly what I intend to bring back to the White House, just like we had for four years. You know, we had four of the greatest years in the history of our country. We rebuilt the military, we cut taxes, the biggest tax cut in history, the biggest regulation cut in history. We defeated ISIS, we defeated ISIS. And we did it at about one one hundredth the time. They said it would take four to five years. It took me like two months, right? Because we have an incredible military and we're not allowed to show. They had Afghanistan, the worst pullout, the most embarrassing day in the history of our country. It's probably the reason, a piece of it, why Russia went into Ukraine. They said, these people are incompetent. We'll go in. So... Russia going into Ukraine would have never happened. None of this stuff that you see would have happened. Israel would have never happened. The attack on October 7th. And you wouldn't have had inflation. As soon as I get back into the Oval Office, I am going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call your mayor and your governor and I'm going to say, this is President Trump and I want to come back and help. Look, you have a Democrat governor, you have a Democrat mayor, and we are going to work with them, and we're going to get this state and this city at a level that it's never, it's never seen before, frankly. I think we can do that, too. We're going to be helping them a lot, much more than anybody would expect. It doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans, because this is about our city and our country, and it's really about the people. And in this case, the people of New York City, New York State, we're going to make you very, very happy. And Biden can't do it. He doesn't know he's alive. You know, see all the stairs here? Stair, stair, two of them behind me, one in the middle. When he's finished with his two and a half minute, you know, do you ever watch his speech? They last for about a minute and a half. When he's finished with his speech, he can never find the stairs. He can never find the stairs. And when he does, it's not a pretty picture either. Thank goodness for Secret Service, they come up and they guide them all. No, this is not what we need. When you see President Xi of China, when you see Kim Jong-un of North Korea, when you see Putin and you see all of these people, they're, they're at the top of their game, whether you like it or not, and they can't believe 
that this has happened to the United States. We have lost respect all over the world. We were the most respected country in the world four years ago. We were respected more than our country was ever respected four years ago. And now we're being laughed at. We're like a joke. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. We're going to do whatever it takes to fix our roads, bridges, and highways. We're going to take back our parks, not just for children, but for everybody. We're going to renovate New York's subway system so it no longer looks like... It hasn't been cleaned since 1932, but rather, it will be the most beautiful transit system anywhere in the world. I don't know if you know it. It's by far the biggest infrastructure, subway infrastructure in the world. And we're going to make it by far the biggest. And now we're going to make it by far the best. We're going to make it beautiful again. And a lot of it is topical. You know, the expensive work people don't understand because they're not in construction. It's topical work. It's topical. It's built. The expensive, the hard, the labor, the money, the big stuff is done. We're going to make it beautiful. We're going to make it good. And... Most importantly, we're going to let New York's finest do its job. The transit cops do their job. We're going to make it safe. Most importantly. And importantly for the people that are before me today, we are going to make life in New York affordable again. It's gotten totally out of control. The minute crooked Joe Biden shuffles out the door, I will rapidly rebuild the greatest economy, the history of the world. Look, we had the greatest economy in history. Everybody here, where you have a small business or if you had a job, you were getting more than you ever made. And we had no inflation. We had no 1.4 percent considered none, considered better than none, because frankly, none in its own way is a bad thing also. We had a perfect number, 1.4 percent. It doesn't matter whether you're black or brown or white or whatever the hell color you are. It doesn't matter. We are all Americans and we're going to pull together as Americans. We all want better opportunity. I'm not just going to promise it. I'm going to deliver it as I did just a short while ago. Think of it. You know, when I went down to Washington, I was only there 17 times. I never stayed over. I didn't know that society. And we had great people. Look at what we did with economic development, with the rebuilding of our military, with the tax cuts, with the oil. We had great people. But we also had some people that I wouldn't have used if I had my choice. Now I know everybody. I know the smart ones. I know the dumb ones. I know the killers. I know the weak ones. I know them all. And you're going to see. But everyone was better off. We had the greatest economy in history. Everybody was better off under a man named President Donald J. Trump. Have you ever heard of him? Have you heard of him? We had gasoline down to $1.87 a gallon and actually times when it was much lower than that. We had a record low poverty rate for black Americans and Hispanic Americans. We had the lowest, we had the best poverty rate in terms of the positive number ever in our history for black Americans and Hispanic Americans. We lifted 6.6 .6 million people out of poverty. Nothing like that has ever happened in our country. And the real middle class income rose over $6,000 a year. Think of that. Under Biden, it's a disaster. Real middle class income has fallen over $2,000 a year. That's a lot. That's a difference of $8,000. Real earnings for African Americans are down 5.6%. African Americans are getting slaughtered. Hispanic Americans are getting slaughtered. And these millions and millions of people that are coming into our country the biggest impact and the biggest negative impact is against our black population and our Hispanic population who are losing their jobs, losing their housing, losing everything they can lose. They're the ones that are affected most by what's happening. Not only the fact that you've lost the use of your schools, your parks and your hospitals, Joe Biden's inflation. <laughs> Have it? 
Speaking of the wall, so we built much more wall than we, we built 571 miles of wall. We had the safest border in history. We were going to put up within a period of three weeks. It was all built, laying there, ready to be put up, designed by the Border Patrol, who are incredible people, ICE, who are incredible people, all together. I want to put up concrete plank for the contractors here. They didn't want it. They had to have hardened steel. They wanted 6,000, 7,000 pound concrete. They wanted rebar in the middle. They wanted different materials, harder to cut. So we had very hard steel, very good stuff. Everything was good. We had the panel on top. It was called an anti-climb panel. We had the best wall. And it was going to be, we were going to add 200 miles of wall. It would have taken about three weeks. And then we had the rigged election. And you know what happened after the rigged election? They took the wall, and instead of putting it up, they sold it for five cents on the dollar. And I said, these people really do want to have an open border. And that's what's happened to our country. Our country has gone to hell because of it. It's gone to hell. But I want to thank Mexico. I want to thank, because I went to Mexico. <laughs> we really have no choice. He said, send him back. There's a chance. Send him back. Nobody wants to send anybody back, but you have no choice. This is not sustainable by any country, right? This is not sustainable. But we had Mexico, and we went to Mexico, and I said to the president of Mexico, good man, by the way, a very good guy, happens to be a socialist, but these are minor details. I said to him, Mr. President, we need you to give us 28,000 soldiers to guard the wall. He said, well, how much would you pay for that? I said, nothing, I'm not paying anything, you're sending them in. They're coming in in caravans, you have to do it. And he smiled and he laughed, he thought it was funny, he thought it was like, you know, I was getting. I said, no, no. They're coming in through Mexico. We need 28,000 soldiers, free of charge. And he said, uh, Donald, I cannot do that. I said, here's what you do. I don't want to embarrass you, so I'm not going to negotiate with you. Send me a negotiator. Give me a top negotiator. I want to see him. And he came, and he came to the White House, a very handsome man, dressed in one of the most beautiful suits I've ever seen. In fact, I was going to ask him, who is your tailor? I'd like to buy one of those suits. But I didn't think it was appropriate to start the negotiation that way. And I said, you know that uh, you're going to give us 28,000 soldiers, don't you? No, 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 we are not going to. We will never do that. I said, of course you're going to. A hundred percent. He said, we're not going to. He said, no way. I said, way. You're going to give it. He said, a hundred percent. And you're also going to have a new policy. It's called remain in Mexico. Nobody can come into our country until they're free. And then you're going to have catch and release into Mexico. You know, we have catch and release into our country. Even if they're criminals, we catch them, we check them, we see they're a criminal, we release them, we say, come back five years later, you'll have a court case. Nobody ever comes back. So I said to the State Department, and a wonderful woman but a bad negotiator, I said to the State Department, Give me a top 10, give me a top 10 list. Give me a top 10 things. I said to ICE and Border Patrol, give me a top 10. They gave me a top 10 list. And a lot of it had to do with all of the horrible disease that pours through. People that have highly contagious diseases are coming into our country at levels that we've never seen before. So many other things. And they gave me a top 10 list, but they laughed. They said, sir, they'll never do. We've been trying to get this stuff for 25 years. I said, if I were a betting man, I would bet you any amount of money. You'll have it very quickly. So this man comes in. I said, we want a policy remain in Mexico, Tijuana. Hundreds of the, probably the fastest growing city in the world for a period of a year. That place was loaded up with people. They weren't allowed into our country. And we had already built a lot of the wall, a tremendous amount, 571 miles. Without that, we couldn't have ever done this. And he said that uh, we're not going to do it, sir. I said, you are going to do it. He said, we're not. I said, here's the story. I'm not going to mess around with you. I have to go. I have a very important meeting, much more important than this. I said, here's the story. You're either going to do it. It's Friday evening or on Monday morning at seven o'clock in the morning. We are going to put a 25 percent tariff on everything that Mexico sends into our country. And then one month later, if you don't do it, we're going to put a 50 percent. Then we're going to go 75. And because I'm a nice person, we're going to stop at a 100 percent tariff. And here's the, and I had it literally written, I'm, I'm saying, should I sign it or not? 
Am I going to waste the ink or not? Because I'll sign it right now. On Monday morning at 7 o'clock, you're going to pay up to a $100 tariff. He said, sir, I'd uh, like to make a phone call. I said, I wonder who you're going to call. Let me guess. You're going to call the president. He comes back three minutes later. Sir, it would be our great honor to give you 28,000 soldiers free of charge. It would be our great honor to have a policy of remain in Mexico. Anyway, and we got the, all 10 things. It took about like 10 minutes. It was not. And now the other day, did you see? Mexico said to crooked Joe Biden, we want $20 billion a year just for the privilege of negotiating with you. We want you to pay us. Did you see that? It was a little article. You hardly. There's a slight difference. Would you say? So he would have never asked that. He would have never asked it. So. He said they want 20 billion, 20 billion, not 20, 20 millions a lot. They want 20 with a B, 20 billion dollars a year just for the privilege of negotiating with Mexico. And you would never get the things that they, they gave up remain in Mexico. They gave up catch and release in Mexico. They gave up this. They gave up everything. They gave up everything. They did. They did give up the Constitution. Joe Biden, his inflation has cost the average New York household a staggering $24,000. Think of that, because the costs have gone up. So much. Bacon has got, I don't eat bacon anymore. It's too expensive. It's true. It's gone up like four times. I said, what's what's with look at the Biden price hikes, very much away inflation, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen like it. And they're costing average New York families a thousand dollars. The inflation, the Biden inflation tax, because it's a tax on day one. We're going to throw out Bidenomics and going to replace it with Maganomics like your hats. Maganomics. And I will give you lower taxes. We're going to cut it still lower. Remember, when I cut taxes, I gave you the biggest tax cut in the history of our country, bigger than the Reagan tax cuts. And you know what? The following year, we reported massive increases in revenue. So with lower taxes, we actually took in more money because it gave incentive for people to work. Lots of reasons. But I will give you low taxes, low inflation, low interest rates, rising wages, growing incomes, and fair trade for the American worker. And we will make energy affordable again by saying, drill, baby, drill. Drill, baby, drill. Your energy costs will come down within the first year by 50%. That's not bad. That's a hell of a promise. And it will, too. We can... Drop that so quickly. Remember, it was his stupid energy policies that caused the inflation. Now it's more than energy. Now everything's like on fire. The whole place is a mess. We will quickly return our nation to the path of prosperity and we will bring our country back together through unparalleled success. Our country is going to be very successful and people are going to come together. And I will tell you. I will tell you, a lot of people say, do you think you can ever get the sides together? And by the way, I have to say something. Our side is much bigger than their side. You see that? Much bigger. We're more quiet, much more quiet. But when we get going, we're much tougher, right? We're much tougher. But it is much bigger. But I saw it. We had the, the greatest economy in history. And I was getting calls from the other side. I call it the radical left. But left-leaning, to put it mildly, Democrats, can we get together? Because everybody had the best they've ever had. African-American jobs were the best in history. Asian-American, the best in history. Hispanic, the best in history. Women, people with a diploma, people without a diploma, people that went to the great Wharton School of Finance, MIT, Harvard, they were doing better, and the people that didn't have a high school diploma were having the best. Everybody was better. There wasn't one group, not one, that went down, and it was bringing our country together. So it can happen. And when they ask, because I get that question a lot, do you think the sides can ever get together? And I went through the experience, and we can get together. And then we had COVID come in, and we had to fight that battle, and we did a great. You know, I've been recognized as having created a great economy, 
and great military, defeating ISIS and all the things. We rebuilt the entire military, created Space Force, all those things. We never got the credit, and we had no wars. Thank you, sir. That's very nice. Remember Hillary Clinton used to point at me? He will create wars. No, no. They said his personality will create wars. I said, no, my personality is going to keep us out of wars. And I was right. First president in 78 years that didn't start a war. We had no wars. None of these stupid wars. Such a shame. When you see all the people that died in these horrible wars in the Middle East and everything else, countries didn't want us, dropping bombs all over the place, spent $9 trillion in the Middle East, we bomb the hell out of the place, then we leave. You know, in the old days, to the victor belong the spoils. We don't do that. We have, we bomb the hell out of everyone, then we come back home. It's so sick. It's so sick and so stupid. These people that led us are so stupid. You want to use that as a last resort. You can solve these problems with a meeting or with a telephone call. You don't have to drop billions of dollars worth of bombs on people's heads. You don't have to. It's called peace through strength. That's really, it really is. And there's no reason for it. What they did in the Middle East is so incredible. They bombed the hell out of the place and then they left. But to the victor belong the spoils, we didn't do that. Now, in Iraq years ago, I was a civilian, so, but I got a lot of publicity for whatever the hell reason. And I said, don't go into Iraq, don't go into Iraq, don't go into Iraq. But if you're going to go in, keep the oil. Well, they went in and they didn't keep the oil. And Iraq now has $350 billion in cash from the oil. And Iran, by us destroying Iraq, the military of Iraq, you know, for years they fought each other, and they were equal sizes, equal everything. They were equal military partners. And for a thousand years under different names, they would fight, a religious thing. They'd fight, they'd go five feet left, five feet right, five feet left, five feet right. Somebody would say they have gas, somebody would say they have nuclear, then they'd rest for a few years, and they'd fight again. But we blew the hell out of one side, Iraq. So now Iraq is a subsidiary, essentially, of Iran. Congratulations for the geniuses that got us into that mess. Because Iran essentially controls, and that was the other thing. When I was president, Iran was broke. They had no money. I said to China, if you buy, they bought a lot of oil. I said, if you buy anything, but if you buy oil from Iran, we are going to do something to you. What's that? You're not going to do any business in the United States. He said, well, that's the end of buying oil from Iran. Every country was told that Iran was broke. They had no money for Hamas. They had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for anything. Then Biden comes in and he takes the terror. He takes all of the sanctions off and they go out. And now Iran has two hundred and twenty three billion dollars. Congratulations. And we're the only ones for five hostages. We just paid six billion dollars. And for electricity for Iraq, we just paid ten billion dollars. And think of it, Iraq has billions of dollars that we're paying for their electricity. So we were in a position, there was no terror, there was no threat, there was no nothing. And now Iran has become a big threat again. And I tell you, I see a lot of flags, a lot of flags from it right out of Israel, right? That's right out of Israel. But remember, I said it, I said it a month ago, and it's a terrible thing to say, but I believe it. Uh, many of the hostages that you're waiting for and everybody's waiting for those hostages, many of them are dead. Many of them are dead. And it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. But many of those hostages are dead. And that's why when you see these negotiations where Hamas is like not getting back, they're saying, man, we could make a good deal, but these people are no, no, no longer alive. When I saw the way they were treated, when I saw the way they were thrown into the cars and how horribly they were treated, there's no way that those hostages and some will be alive, but many of those hostages are dead. It's a very, it's a very serious, horrible thing. It would have never happened if the election weren't rigged. It would have never happened if I were your president, they would have never done it. Because we have so many young people here today, I want to talk about, just for a moment, about success. 
Do you remember I used to give talks on success before politics? Okay, that's enough. We're going to do it. That's. I know you're on our side, but it's enough. We're going to get them home. It's a rough, it's a rough situation. But remember, we used to give talks on success for the learning addicts and for others. And I used to do that before politics. And maybe it's one of the reasons I went in. But because, well, bringing our city back, it starts with getting the right leadership. It also involves men and women just like you. But I talk a lot about success and I get paid money to talk about success. I would have done it for nothing. But then because of politics, and if you take a look, because of politics, I stopped doing that. But I think we're in the Bronx. We have young people, people that aspire to success. And I just wanted to know, I'm so tired of politics. Can we devote six minutes to success? Okay. So, for all of you young people, I think it's, you know, look, I've been through tremendous, I've had great success, I've had it in entertainment, I've had it in business, I've had it in politics. You know, I ran for office. What office did you run for, President? How'd you do? I won. Actually, I won twice. You know, we did much better the second time, so. You know, we got millions more votes the second time. But it doesn't compare to this time. We, there is so much more, we had tremendous enthusiasm when we, you know, I don't call her crooked Hillary anymore, I call her beautiful Hillary, because I took crooked and used it for Joe. I don't like using it for two people. But we had tremendous enthusiasm in 2016. We had unbelievable more enthusiasm in 2020 because we did such a good job. In fact, one of the big problems in 2016 was the wall, it was the border, I fixed it. So good that I couldn't talk about it in 2020. I kept saying to my people, I want to talk about the wall. I want to talk about the great job I did on immigration. I stopped people from coming in. They said, sir, nobody cares. You already fixed it. I said, this is a terrible thing. You fix it, you can't talk about it. But let's talk about for the young people just to listen for a couple of minutes because we've been talking about politics so long. I'm OD'd. You know what that means? I'm OD'd on politics. I'm OD'd on Trump. I turn on the television. Trump, 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 Trump. All different stories. Trump. They're driving us crazy. So I believe in the expression. Did you ever hear this expression? The harder you work, the luckier you get. You know who said that? A great golfer named Gary Player. He was smaller than other golfers, but he worked harder than other golfers. And he ended up with the most career wins of any golfer. He ended up with nine majors. And, you know, he was small in stature, but big right up here but he made that say it was the first time i ever heard about it he said it's a funny thing happens the harder i work the luckier i get that was an athlete saying that amazing right it's the first time i heard it probably been said by others but it's true i can tell you if you didn't work really hard there is very little chance that i would be standing here right now another part of success is something i learned from my father i had a wonderful father wonderful parents i'm lucky you got to be lucky got to get great parents if you're going to spend your life working really hard you have to love it you have to pick something that you really enjoy sometimes your parents will say don't do that but you got a little bit in that case you got to follow your own way you got to love it ideally you're going to love something where there's a potential because there are some things you love but it's not going to do you so good so ideally, fall in love with something that's good. Some people go into a business where it's a very hard business. If you can go into a business, that's an easier business and do well. But uh, I see it all the time. Somebody has every ingredient for success, smart, brilliant, everything's good. But they're in a business where you hit your head on the wall. It's a very tough business. Try finding something where it's a great business with a great future. And there are plenty of them out there. My father taught me about construction. But what I really learned from him was that he worked seven days a week because he really loved to do it. I mean, he would work on Sunday, he'd go to church in the morning, and then he'd go and work. And I know some people that don't believe in working on Sunday. You couldn't keep him away from work. But he loved working, and he was happy. He was married for a long time. That's one thing I'm not going to top him on. He was married. <laughs> he was married for a long time, decades and decades. I said, Top, Pop, I'm not going to beat you on that one. Never going to beat you. But because his work made him happy, but he was happy when he worked and he was successful and he knew what he was doing. He'd build a house on one side of the street. Somebody else would build a house on the other side of the street. 
and he'd build his house faster, better, cheaper, and he'd sell it for less money. The other guy would build the house for more money, take him longer, couldn't sell it. My father would go buy the house for less money than it cost him to build the first one, and he'd sell it. And you know, in the old days, a long time ago, his brother was a professor at MIT. My father worked, he was a little younger than my father. My father put him to school. He went to MIT, very brilliant guy, Professor John Trump, the longest serving professor in the history of MIT, 41 years, I believe. Dr. John Trump. My father used to tell me I used to go crazy. My, your uncle was always getting degrees. I had to keep building, building for your uncle to get him through college. He was always up there getting degrees. But he was at MIT for 41 years, a brilliant guy. He used to talk to me about nuclear because he was a nuclear genius, along with a genius at about everything else. And he used to say that someday there'll be a time when a small package carried by hand can blow up an entire city. And I said, no way, Uncle John, that, that's never going to happen, Uncle John. Guess what? He was right a long time ago that he said it. But my father would price a house. And I'd say, how did you price in those days, Dad? He said, pricing was everything. He said, I'd sell a house for $3,999.99. And that one penny made the difference between selling it and not. One penny. If I made it $4,000, I wouldn't sell. But psychologically, $3,999.99. And he sold houses. And guys wouldn't sell them. But he used to tell me that one penny sounds crazy, but it wasn't crazy. Psychologically, thought, people thought they were buying it for $3,000, not $4,000. It's sort of like getting an 89 at a test in school, or a 90. A 90 is an A. And an 89, one point, is a B plus. Another lesson when times are tough, sometimes that's when you perform the best. You have to learn that about yourself. You have to learn it about yourself. Are you okay? Are you guys okay? Oh, okay, take your time, yeah? Take your time. Doctor, any doctor, please? Doctor in the house. Thank you. Are you okay? You take your time, darling. Yeah. Yeah. Take your time. Take your time, Doc. We have time. Some people waited here for two days. It's uh, tough. It's tough. Thank you. Plenty of time. That's good. Water. Okay. She doing all right? She doing okay? Thank you. Plenty of time. Okay. Thank you. Doctor, thank you very much, doctors. We've got a lot of doctors in the house. Thank you very much. Thank you, darling. That's great. That's great. Great job. People do a fantastic job here. But it's hot. 
And it's been a long wait, right? Long wait. Thank you very much, doctor. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm, I know she's going to be okay because she's so tough. Some of the greatest days of my business career were in the toughest times, but I enjoyed waking up every single morning and go to battle. A lot of people say to me today, the toughest business people, people that you know about, could I ask you a question? How do you do it? I say, do what? How do you get up in the morning and put your pants on? Why do you put the pants on? I'll explain it to you someday. How do you do it? How do you get up? How do you do it? How can you want to do with what you do? They're after you. They're after you. These horrible human beings are after you all the time. Impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two, lawsuits all over. And they're doing it to injure the political opponent of an incompetent candidate because he can't run fairly and squarely. And I say, you know what I do? I just do it. I put on the blinders. I say, I just do it. We do it. And the other question they ask me is, will it happen again? And we have to make it too big to rig. We got a lot of great people watching. We have to make it too big to rig. But one of the things you need in success is momentum. You need momentum. You got to have. And when you have that momentum going, there's nothing that can stop you. And I tell the story of Bill Levitt. Bill Levitt was a great real estate man. Great. Levitt towns all over the country. One of the most successful real estate people at a certain age ever. And he built these massive towns that were, you know, there's, there was nothing like him at the time and very successful. And he was offered a lot of money to sell to a big public company. And he decided to take it. He was a young man. He was in his 40s. And he said, darling, I'm going to take it. Told his wife, I want to take the money. And for 20 years, he went out. He bought a yacht. He lived a beautiful life. He lived in the south of France, he lived, but he got bored. And 21, 22 years later, he said, I want to make a comeback. I can't stand this life anymore. I want to make a comeback. And he went to the company that he sold to, a big public company that did very poorly. They had no idea what they were doing. And, you know, he used to, by the way, he used to pick up every nail, every piece of wood, every, he used to sell the sawdust, everything. He would say every penny was a major event. And now you had this big public company. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. So he went back and he made them an offer. They didn't want to sell and he paid a little more, a little more. And he ended up buying it for an okay price. And he was so happy. He said, now I can go back to work. And he went back and everything he touched turned bad. The market turned on him. The jobs turned on him. He was no longer able to get zoning. He was spending a fortune. He had just purchased it for a lot of money. And he ended up going bankrupt. He was bankrupt. And I was young when I met him. And I was at the party of a very big person, big public company person. And Bill Levitt was there. And I was in the real estate business, so I knew who he was. And you probably indirectly know who. And everybody was shunning him a little bit. Nobody cared about him anymore. But I did. And I went over to him and I say, hi, Mr. Levitt, I'm Donald Trump. I know it. I was doing great. I was sort of like a hot guy. I was hot as a pistol. I think I was hotter than I am now and I became president, okay? I don't know. I said to somebody, was I hotter before or hotter now? I don't know, who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? Who the hell cares, right? But he knew who I was and I, I went up, I said, so are you okay? And he said, I'm not really okay. I made a mistake uh, that I'll never forget. And he was by this time a pretty old guy. And he was sitting in the corner of this magnificent Fifth Avenue apartment where there were 25 very successful people. But I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to find out what happened because he lost everything. Everybody knew it. It's very public. And I said, what happened exactly? What happened? He said, son, I lost my momentum. I had something going that couldn't be stopped. And I should have just stayed. I lost my momentum. And I've never forgotten the term. If you lose your momentum, you got to figure it out. But Bill Levitt lost his momentum and he died penniless. And he was the biggest real estate person on the planet. And I've never forgotten that story. And it was a sad story. He was a good man, too. I thought he was a good man, but did an unbelievable job. Today, that you have Levitt towns all over the country and pretty amazing. But you have to always keep moving forward. And when it's your time, you have to know it's your time. 
And I said to myself, in terms of politics, I said, you know what? We did so well in number one, we did even better in number two. I said, we got to do it again because we have to do it. Maybe I'm wrong. And I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it to make America great again. You know, if I didn't think we won, easily won, the la I would never do this. Because you know what? In many ways, it's easier. You, you have a winner, you have a loser. It's okay. I won once. It was a big upset, I guess. I don't know why it was an upset. Because I'd go and I'd have 50,000 people at a rally. She'd go and have 200 people. And then they say, why did I win Michigan? Why did I win Pennsylvania? Why did I win all these states that a Republican hadn't won in many years? Why? And by the way, we're up in Pennsylvania. We're up in Michigan. We're up in New Hampshire today. We're up in Florida at numbers that you wouldn't even believe. But I also think it's very important to know what you want, you have to set your sights high, set your sights so high, higher than you ever thought possible, and make your goals big and go after it. That's why I say we won't just make New York a little better. I say we want to make New York a lot better, better than it ever was before, right? And finally, you have to take pride in your accomplishments. Do not take for granted what you've achieved. Forget it. It's over. It's good for your confidence, but it's over. Go forward. Think to the future, not to the past, but learn from the past. You know, wherever I go, I know that if I could build a skyscraper in Manhattan, I could do anything. It's very tough. Building a 68-story building on Fifth Avenue is hard with all you have to deal with. I mean, you have unions, you have legal entanglements, property rights, zoning. You're dealing with the smartest and toughest contractors in the world. These are killers. Many of you are here today. Thank you very much. But by comparison, talking to world leaders, I believe is easier. And I've done them both. Talking to a world leader, if you're smart, you know, you have the United States behind you. Now the country's not the same, but it'll be better and stronger and bigger in a very short period of time. You know, uh, we have so many different things we could discuss having to do with the Republican Party. But the biggest thing I think, and I really mean this, and it's happening more and more, and I see it all the time, because really you have to be the party of common sense as opposed to the Democrat Party. It's a party of failure, extremism, and gross incompetence. And that's what it is. We're, and they're going to destroy our country. But our country has faced down much harder challenges before and come back stronger than ever. That's why I so firmly believe that we can quickly make America a great and glorious nation again. When I take office, we are going to restore public safety and the rule of law in New York City. That starts with stopping the pouring into our country of millions and millions of illegal immigrants, which are causing a new category of violence called the migrant crime. We have a migrant crime happening now. You add that to the crime already. A terrible statistic. Venezuela was a very crime-ridden country. They just announced a month ago, 67, but now they just announced 72% reduction in crime in Venezuela. In Caracas, they took their gang members, they took their drug dealers, they are emptying out their prisons, they, they're taking everybody that's a problem and they're dumping them into the United States of America. We're like a dumping ground. But many countries are doing that. I would say eventually all countries would be doing that. If I headed up Honduras, if I headed up any one of the countries that are neighboring or not neighboring, and we're not talking about just South America countries. We're talking about countries from Africa. The other day, 22, think of it, 22 people from the Congo. Where do you live? We came from jail. What did you do in jail? We don't want to tell you. They're now living happily. They come from Africa. They come from Asia. They come from all over the world. They come from the Middle East. Yemen. We're bombing Yemen. Here we go with the bombs again. We're bombing Yemen. And people are coming in from Yemen. Large numbers of people are coming in from China. And if you look at these people, did you see them? They are physically fit. They're 19 to 25, almost everyone is a male, and they look like fighting age. I think they're building an army. They had 29,000 people over the last. I think they're building, they want to get us from within. I think they're building an army. This is not, 
You know, it's interesting. Did you see them? They all have tents. They all have gas-fired stoves. I mean, this is not like an illegal immigrant. This is, they're building something. They have something in mind. We're going to end all of that stuff. They respected your president. They respected our country. And we're not going to let people, we are not going to let these people come in and take our city away from us and take our country away from us. It's not going to happen. Now, who would let people, seriously, who would let people come from prisons and jails, from mental institutions? They cannot stay. We will immediately begin the largest criminal deportation operation in our country's history because this situation is sustainable by no country. No country can sustain this. As we speak, there are hundreds of thousands of Biden migrants invading our city and our country. We no longer have border states like Texas and Arizona. All states, including New York, are be a border state. The people are pouring through Texas. They are pouring through Arizona. They are pouring through every state. Every state is now a border state. Every state is now, we're talking about, in my opinion, 16 to 17 million people. And these are not necessarily people that are going to help us as a country. We want to be nice. We want to be respectful. They're coming from so many places. We don't have any idea. In many cases, we don't even know what the language. You know, you have languages that people don't even know about. We have languages where there's nobody in our country that speaks these languages. They're coming from places we have no idea what's happening with our country. The flood of migrants is putting crippling burdens on our communities, your schools, hospitals, parks, and public resources. Frankly, we're lucky to get this big park. I don't know how the hell we did it. It must be New York's finest. I don't know how we did it. They call it the Biden migrant invasion, and it's wrong. It's immoral. And the vast majority of New Yorkers agree with me that this is unacceptable. We, it's unacceptable. We must stop it. We must stop it immediately. And you know, for the people coming up, it's also unacceptable. They come up in what's called caravans. The women are treated horribly. They're being raped at levels that nobody's ever seen before. Nobody wants to talk about it. The fake news will report that, oh, it's so terrible what he said. But it's, it's fact. It's fact. The people are being treated. They're coming up in 100 degrees, and then it's freezing. They're coming through snake-infested areas. It's a hell of a journey, and so many people are dying coming up. If we told them, please do not come up, you're not going to come in. Like I was telling them, for a long period of time, they wouldn't come. They're being offered. Look at California Governor Newsom. Governor Newsom. He offers education. He offers medical care. He offers pensions, he offers everything. He'll even give them an electric car because they're all over the place. How about the electric mandate? You like the all electric mandate? Not too much. Huh? Does anybody like a car that doesn't go very far? Costs a lot. In Brooklyn, American students at James Madison High School were recently told they had to stay at home from school so their classrooms could be turned into housing for thousands of, right? Thousands of migrants. Very simply, Joe Biden puts illegal aliens first. I put America first. I put America first. Would anybody... Now, this is up to you. Has anybody heard the snake? Would anybody like to hear the snake? Because we can stay here all night, I don't care. Would you like to hear the snake? So it's a metaphor, it's an old song, and it was redone. It didn't have anything to do with snakes or people or illegal immigration, but this has to do with illegal immigration. And I think it's very accurate, actually, and it's very sad. But I'll go and we'll do it, and some of you have heard it, and many of you haven't. But we're going to do it right now for the great people of the Bronx and elsewhere. We love the Bronx. 
We love the Bronx. Are you ready? On her work, and, and you know what? You know what this is all about, right? Did you know? You've heard this before? Have you heard it? We got the greatest people here. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, he said. I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by the fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and soon as she arrived, she found the pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, you truly would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again and kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, ma'am, the snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bitten me, but why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Shut up, silly woman said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Right? So when we allow people from prisons, when we allow people from insane asylums and mental institutions, which are being emptied out all over the world, you know, their prison populations are going way down. You know why? Because they're being dumped into the United States. When we are allowing terrorists at numbers that we've never seen before, remember the snake. Remember the snake. Because you're going to get bitten like you never got bitten before. And you need a new president. And you have to get rid of this person who is not a smart person, not a respected person, and doesn't have a clue what the hell is happening. So that's the snake. Did you enjoy the snake? Yeah. On day one, I will seal the border and I will stop the invasion of our country. Very sadly. In recent years, we have also seen our city destroyed by bad, radical left, pro-crime policy that virtually everyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent, everyone, you all know it's a disaster. You know the names of these lunatic policies. No cash bail. Somebody kills somebody. Go out. No bail. We have, don't worry. Go out and kill a couple of more people. Defund our great police. Defund the police. Sanctuary cities. Release violent repeat offenders from jail. Joe Biden supports all of this insanity and much more, but millions of people across New York know it's crazy. There is no way when you watch this guy get off an airplane, you, he doesn't even have to talk. When he falls out of a helicopter, he's got three little stairs. It's not that hard. You got two railings. You don't fall out of helicopters. You don't fall upstairs. He falls up. He has more trouble going up than he does coming down. That's a little sick. But you, you're just not going to vote for him. You're just not. We got to win. If we just win the state. It just puts it right. It's such a big state. It puts it to bed. You're going to have a president and people, but you're going to have a president that understands what we have to do. We have to be nice about it, but we have to do things. And we're going to be done. And the world is going to respect us again. We were never so respected as we were four years ago. President Xi of China, Putin, you know, uh, Viktor Orban. Did you ever hear of him? Uh, Prime Minister of Hungary. Very tough guy. Known as a strong man. Oh, they hate it when I talk about him because they say he's a strong man. Trump loves strong men. I don't know. I like weak men, actually. I like weak men. I'd much rather have a weak man than a strong man. But he is a strong man. And they asked him, why is it that the whole world is blowing up? He said, one simple reason, Trump is not president in the United States. He said, you put Trump back as president and the whole world is going to get better because they were afraid of Trump. They couldn't figure Trump out. Trump was a rather difficult person. But he used the word afraid. I don't use it. 
I don't use it for it. I use the word respect. They respected your president. They respected the United States of America. And they're going to do it again, and it's going to happen fast. But we have to get this absolute disaster. The worst president in history. He makes Jimmy Carter look like he had a brilliant administration. It's the only thing, the only happy person about Joe Biden is Jimmy Carter, because Jimmy looks brilliant by comparison. I also want to thank New York's finest. I grew up with them. I know them. I love them. I love our firemen. I love our teachers. These are incredible people, and we have to bring the word respect and honor back to them, right where it belongs. A few weeks ago, I visited with a grieving family, New York police officer, Jonathan Diller. What a beautiful family. He was a beautiful person. He was 31 years old, gunned down during a traffic stop by a vicious thug. And uh, just, uh, just horrible, leaving his beautiful young wife behind, a son, Ryan, behind, one-year-old son. And it was the saddest day. It was a horrible thing. Opened the door and just started shooting him. The criminal charge was savagely murdering Officer Dillon, who was previously arrested by the NYPD 21 times. And he was allowed to go out because of the political things they do here. I'm the only one they want to keep. If I ever said, I want no bail, they'd say, you got to pay a fortune. If I ever say, oh, no cash bail, that sounds good, that sounds good. No, it doesn't apply to Trump. I'm the only one it doesn't apply to, probably. And the accomplice driving the car had been arrested 14 times and was actually a far more violent person. And his nickname was Killer. They called him Killer. These dangerous and violent repeat offenders should never have been on our streets Jonathan should be alive today, but they were released again and again and again. I will not sit by and accept this reckless insanity when I am in the White House. I will stand up to the Marxist DAs and Soros prosecutors, and we will tell them no more. We're not going to stand for it. We will not let them destroy our communities. We will not let them destroy our country. There's a 53% increase in felony assaults on your subways. 53%, that's in a short period of time. Since 2019, murders are up more than 20%. Shootings are up more than 30%. I'm going to indemnify all police officers and law enforcement officials throughout the United States to protect them from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong actions on crime. And remember, black, Hispanic, Asian people need this protection and safety more than anyone else. Don't ever forget it. And after years of talk by the radical left Democrats, we are going to give them the protection they need and we're gonna protect our police. We're gonna make sure they do a great job. They can do it very quickly. They know who the bad guys are. They know everything about them. They know their name. They know their middle initial. We're going to insist that if a violent criminal murders a police officer, they receive the death penalty. It's going to be quick. And I also want to work with your mayor and your governor, happen to be Democrats, to clean up the homeless encampments so that you can once again enjoy your parks and your public spaces. Right now, you don't have public spaces. They're occupied by migrants in tents. Pleasures as simple as a walk in the park or watching your children again play in a little league game will come roaring back and they're going to come back very quickly. Your lifestyle and the American dream will be with you once again. And we're going to bring it back, the American dream. You don't have an American dream right now. You will be proud and your children and your country will be even prouder of you. Years ago, people with severe mental illness were in mental institutions and then a certain governor, I won't mention the name because at this point, what difference? They dumped all of them into the streets because they said those institutions were too expensive to run. So now they live on our streets and that's what we have. This is no good for anybody. It's bad for the people who need help and it's bad for the people of our city and it's a horrible, horrible way to live. I want to work in partnership with your local leaders, Democrats, pretty much all, and move the severely mentally ill off your streets and back into a place where they can get help and the help that they desperately need. I want to recognize, by the way, a few very special people. You have some really great people here. And I'm sorry I can't mention all. We have congressmen all over the place. But I just can't mention you today. You're never going to speak to me. But we, would anybody like to hear these congressmen's names? 
But I do have to mention a few people. We're truly honored to be joined by a man who is a Democrat and a former member of the New York City Council, and he's been a friend of mine, and he helped me very much with the Ferry Point Project and getting it working and did a really good job. Ruben Diaz Sr. Come on up, Ruben. Good. Thank you. Mr. President, I am a Puerto Rican, a black Puerto Rican. I used to be a state senator for 15 years. And I used to be city council member. Today I'm here for various reasons. But I want to tell you first that as a Puerto Rican, as a Hispanic, I want to apologize to you for the conduct of George, or, or George Juan Merchant. As a Hispanic, I want to apologize. Thank you. Thank you. He's, he's been used. He has been used to destroy you. But we know better than that. We know better than that. As a minister, president of the New York Hispanic Clergy Organization, I want to tell AOC, this morning, she intended to become a prophet. And she said, even God doesn't want Trump in the Bronx because it's going to rain. Madame Prophet AOC, you have become a false, a false prophet. Look, look at what a beautiful day. That means that not only you guys want Trump in the Bronx, because, because if we're going to measure that for the weather, then I would say humbly that even God wants you in the Bronx. And I want and I want I want to close by saying I want to close by saying Mr. President I want to join you in having the Bronx great again. Please accept this Democrat, this black Puerto Rican with a kinky hair and a broken English. Please accept my endorsement for you as a president. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was, how nice was that? I didn't expect that. Really? That was beautiful. You know, it's always dangerous to do that. You never know what's going to come out. Maybe he'll change his mind coming up, but he doesn't change his mind. That man is a winner. He's a winner and a great man. Thank you very much, Ruben. Also with us is New York native and current U.S. Congressman. He's hot as a pistol. Oh, boy, he has a future. And he's a great friend of mine, Byron Donalds. Come up, please, Byron. Oh, 
Wow. Mr. President, there's more of them here now than when I was up about an hour and a half ago. If there's one thing we know is that this man was one of the best presidents this country has ever had. And if there's another thing that we know is that all of you are going to make him the 47th president of the United States. Thank you, Byron. Great. What a good future. Here as well is rapper Chef G. Does everybody know Chef? Where is Chef G? Where is he? Come on up, fellas. Rapper Sleepy Hollow. Come on up here, fellas. How are you, man? Hey. Oh, you know, oh I like that. I want to get that done. <laughs> President Trump, oh, one thing, one thing I want to say. One thing I want to say. They always gonna whisper your accomplishments and shout your failures. Trump gonna shout the wins for all of us. Make America great again. Thank you very much. That's for I like those teeth. I want to find out where you did. I got to get my teeth like that. I want that to happen to me. As somebody with a fantastic future of the Republican Party and beyond, Gavin Wax. Thank you, young Republicans. Gavin, wherever you are. Thank you, Gavin. Adam Solis of New York, young Republicans who's been Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job you're doing. Madeline Brame of Blexit. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you very much. Somebody that's a real star in politics and has done an incredible job and so popular in Nassau County, the county executive, Nassau County, Bruce Blakeman. Come up, Bruce, for a second. Come up, Bruce. Where is Bruce? We got to get Bruce. Where is he? That's a long way to come up to hell with, Bruce, right? Come on up, Bruce. Come on. This guy is central casting. If I'm doing a movie and a politician, this is the guy I have playing. Come on. That's great. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Both my parents we're World War II veterans. Not many people can say about that. They would be shocked and appalled by what's going on in this foreign invasion from our southern border. Nassau County is not a sanctuary county. And when Donald Trump gets reelected, this will not be a sanctuary country. God bless America. Good man, good man. Thank you very much. Guys. National Committeeman and Chairman Joe Cairo. Joe, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Andrew, thank you very much for being here. Star, star of the future. I heard you made a good speech. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. We have so many people out there, but we're not... We're going to finish this up. This has been, I didn't know. I woke up, I said, I wonder, will it be hostile or will it be friendly? It was beyond friendly. It was a love fest. From the very first day that we take back the White House, I believe we are going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. We're going to restore peace through strength. We're going to keep radical Islamic terrorists out of our country. We're going to protect our great seniors, and I will never let anyone touch your Medicare or your Social Security. Under the Democrat program, they will be gone. We are going to restore free speech in America. We are going to fight for your right 
to school choice, something you all want. And I will not allow schools to impose COVID vaccine mandates or mask mandates. We are going to get far left Marxist lunacy out of our children's classrooms. We're going to keep men out of women's sports. And we will once and for all secure our elections. But all of this saving New York and saving America starts with telling crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in history, you're fired like the upper, you're fired. Get out. You were terrible. You destroyed. You're destroying our country, Joe. Get out. If you want to help, you must vote. I believe that we can win New York State. We have levels of we have levels of support that nobody's seen before. I mean, look at this. So register, volunteer, turn out everyone you know. Don't assume it doesn't matter just because you live in a blue city. You live in a blue city, but it's going red very, very quickly. We must work together as a team to win. New York has always been the home of proud patriots like you. You are proud patriots. You love this. You love this city. You love this state and you love our country. New York was the city loved by Teddy Roosevelt, Norman Rockwell, the great Flo Ziegfeld, General Douglas MacArthur, George Gershwin, Frank Sinatra, and in baseball alone, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Jackie Robinson, and many, many others. It's a city where workers and skilled craftsmen strode across steel beams 80 stories high to build the great Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building and all of the others. It's the city that lit up the shining lights of Broadway that turned Times Square from a seedy, dirty, long-forgotten area into one of the greatest crossroads of light and glamour anywhere in the world. It's a city that produced generations of everyday American heroes who willingly spilled their blood and gave everything they had to make America into the greatest nation in the history of the world. Above all, this is the place that every one of us here today has been proud to call our home, our town, our city. And we are the ones who are going to make our city great again. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this city, and it is hardworking patriots, and this is something you can say it, and you can say it a million times, and you can emblazon it. It's hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. You are going to save our country. We're gonna get out and vote like never before. We're gonna make it too big to rig. Our vote is going to be too big to rig. So one thing they can't guard against, working together, there is nothing we cannot do and no height we cannot achieve. Together we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. We will make America great again. Thank you, Bronx. Thank you, New York. We love you. Thank you. God bless everybody. God bless you. God bless you.